Thank you. That concludes general questions. We're going to turn now to First Minister's questions. Number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you. Presiding officer, I'm sure I'm not alone in having received correspondence in recent days from parents at St Ambrose and Buchanan High Schools in Cope Bridge concerned about the environmental safety of the site. Teachers are currently out on strike and there are further reports in today's press detailing concerns raised a decade ago before the schools were built. I'd like to examine some of the practical issues with the First Minister today. Will the Scottish Government confirm that its review will be wide enough in scope to examine all the evidence that is coming to light from the time the school building was planned right through to the present day. First Minister. Thank Ruth Davis for, for raising uh, this issue and uh, presiding officer, if I may take a bit of time to address some of the serious concerns that have been raised. I fully understand the concerns of parents, uh, staff and pupils at the school and I am determined, uh, as the government is determined, to do everything necessary to allay those concerns, address any issues and re-establish confidence. That is why we have established the expert review team to carry out a thorough independent investigation and the answer to Ruth Davidson's question is yes, it will have the ability to look into any uh, relevant matter. The review team visited the school yesterday, it will conclude its work before the end of the summer holidays. Um, it will be for the review team to consider what further tests of pupils, staff and indeed the site itself are required. Uh, we are liaising closely with the local council and with the health board and will continue to do so. Uh, the Deputy First Minister and I will meet with officials later today to get an early update on the work being done and indeed the Deputy First Minister will meet with parents next week. Ruth Davison. I thank the First Minister for that response and I think it's important that we put on record that both the Council and the NHS Board are insisting that the site is safe. But the First Minister will know that confidence among parents is low and that many feel their concerns are not being taken seriously. As Professor Andrew Waterston of Stirling University has said, trust, transparency and good communication should be the key to dealing with these issues. The Buchanan High School case almost looks like a case study in how not to deal with the public. The teaching unions at the school have asked for updated testing to be carried out to give people further assurances, but they say that that request is currently being denied. I think that it's a sensible idea. Is this something that the First Minister might be able to address? First Minister. Uh, yes, I'm more than happy to address that point specifically. Let me say, first of all, and say this very directly to parents at the school, uh, that their concerns are being taken by me and by this government extremely seriously. We will not rest until we have ensured that all issues have been properly investigated, that any issues identified are redressed and that every single parent of a child uh, at St Ambrose or Buchanan High uh, has confidence in sending uh, their children to school. In terms of testing, as I said in response to my initial answer, it will be for the review team to decide what further tests of pupils are required or indeed staff at the school or the site itself and uh, anything that the review team considers is necessary should happen and I and the Deputy First Minister have been very clear about that. Um, aside from that, any parent with concerns should discuss these concerns with their GP. Uh, the government is already liaising with NHS Lanarkshire to ensure that there are resources in place to deal with any uh, consequent increase in demand for NHS services. Uh, as I said a moment ago, uh, the DFM and I will meet with officials later uh, to have an early update on this work and to look at whether there are further actions uh, that require to be taken at this stage. Uh, but the intention here is to get to a position where we assure parents about the safety of the school that their children go to. Uh, finally, uh, just to reiterate a point that Ruth Davison rightly made, it is the view of the NHS board and the local authority uh, that the school is safe uh, for pupils to attend, uh, but it's not enough, I think, for us to say that. We have a duty to convince and to assure parents of that, and that is what we are determined to do. Ruth Davison. I thank the First Minister for addressing the issue of the review team looking again at environmental tests. Another way of restoring trust is to give parents clear assurances that their children have not been affected in any way. But parents have been telling us that they're finding it difficult to get any medical tests carried out and in some cases are paying privately to put their minds at rest. Can the First Minister and the Health Secretary look into this matter to see if parents are able to access tests that might reassure them that their children are well and that the school is indeed safe? First Minister. Uh, well, as I indicated in my uh, previous answer, we are already taking steps to do that, uh, Scottish Government officials 
uh, are liaising with NHS Lanarkshire to make sure that there is an understanding uh, of the increased demand of the requests that are being made uh, and the ability to respond to that uh, and to put in place the resources that are required uh, to deal with that. Uh, the view of the local health board is that there is no need for population testing, but that is something we want the review team to look at and if they come to a different conclusion uh, then any recommendation will be implemented but in the meantime uh, concerned parents should have the ability to discuss that with their GP and take informed decisions and uh, we are working to make sure that the health service locally is able to deal with and respond to any requests of that nature. And Ruth Davison. I had been asked to raise this today because trust between parents and staff at the school and the local government and health authorities is breaking down. And I very much hope that the assurances given by the First Minister today will seek to restore that trust. What is worrying is that concerns were raised as far back as 2009 when plans for the school were first proposed. And I hope that the ongoing review uh, to which the First Minister refers and is due to be published over the summer will give the local community the assurances that they need. But if it does not, does the First Minister agree with me and with the local community that a full independent inquiry may be required in order to help these excellent schools come back together? First Minister. Well, uh, can I take those points in turn? Firstly, I am aware that, rightly or wrongly, uh, there is an issue of, of trust on the part of parents and what they are being told. That is exactly why we took the decision last week to establish the independent review in order to address very directly those issues. And I hope that through the process of this review, we can do exactly that. Uh, issues around planning and what happened and what information was available in 2010, of course, that was part of the planning process, which was the responsibility of the local authority. I know certain reports were uh, issued and considered then, and my understanding is uh, the local authority took full account of that. But of course, if those are issues that require to be looked at in terms of the independent review, then that is exactly what should happen. Um, and in terms uh, of the last part of the question, um, I would say right now, I, I want to make sure that the independent review process we set up last week uh, does what we want it to do. It gets to the heart of any issues and reassures parents. I'm not going to rule anything out beyond that. I said at the outset uh, that we will not rest until we have got to the heart of these issues, addressed any concerns, allayed the concerns of parents and re-established confidence and we will do whatever it takes to do that. I hope that can be done through this independent review and I hope all members uh, will support it as it gets on with its work in the weeks ahead. Thank you. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, Presiding officer, in 2013, uh, the First Minister said, we set up the Scottish Welfare Fund to ensure that we are doing everything we can for the most vulnerable across Scotland. Everything we can. Can the First Minister tell us how much is in the Scottish Welfare Fund this year compared to 2013 when it was first launched? First Minister. Uh, we fund uh, the Scottish Welfare Fund, I, I think, uh, if memory serves me correctly, to the tune of around £38 uh, million pounds a year. Uh, we have, uh, indeed, since uh, 2013, through the Welfare Fund, seen more than 600,000 uh, crisis grants being awarded. And again, from 2013 to December uh, 2018, uh, 240 almost community care grants awarded as well. We will continue to do what we can to provide support for individuals and families in need through the welfare fund, through the money we are spending mitigating the impact of uh, conservative government welfare cuts. But as Richard Leonard and I have spoken about uh, previously, uh, much of the driver of increased poverty in our country right now comes from those welfare cuts. Uh, and I think it becomes more urgent with every day that passes that we join together to get these powers out of the hands of the Tories and into the hands of this parliament. <coughs> Richard Leonard. Uh, Presiding officer, the answer to the question I asked is not a penny more. It was £33 million in 2013. It's £33 million today. And don't just take my word for it. A new report out today called The Scottish Welfare Fund Strengthening the Safety Net by the Menu for Change campaign concludes that, and I quote, the overall Scottish Welfare Fund budget, including both the administration budget and programme budget, has remained unchanged since 2013-14 when it was introduced. This represents a real terms cut. In fact, the Scottish Welfare Fund has suffered a real terms cut of £3.5 million since it was introduced. And just last month, the Scottish Fiscal Commission revealed 
that the Scottish Government has no plans to change the level of funding over the next six years. At this rate, by 2025, that would mean a real terms cut in the Scottish Welfare Fund of over £7 million. Remember, this is a fund that helps some of the most vulnerable people in Scotland. So at a time of rising poverty, what is the First Minister's justification for year-on-year -year cuts to the Scottish Welfare Fund? First Minister. Well, of course, in the period in advance of us setting the budget for uh, the year that we're now in, Richard Leonard and the Scottish uh, Labour Party did not raise the issue of the Scottish Welfare Fund with the Finance Secretary on even one single occasion. In fact, uh, the only submission that was made uh, to the Finance Secretary was from Alec Rowley. To his credit, he made a submission and he suggested that we had an across-the-board cut in budgets of 3% in order to protect uh, local government services. We have protected the Welfare Fund in the face of cuts to our budget uh, from the Scottish Government. In addition to the Welfare Fund, we are investing £125 million in this year to mitigate welfare cuts coming at it from the Tories. Uh, we're investing uh, £350 million in our council tax reduction scheme, uh, £64 million in discretionary housing payments to mitigate the bedroom tax imposed on us uh, by the Tories, an additional £2 million in our fair food fund, uh, £1.5 million in our financial health check service and a whole range of other initiatives including the Best Start grant to help families in poverty. Uh, we will continue to do that because that is our obligation. But the sooner this Parliament is able to attack poverty at source and take the reasons that are causing the increase in poverty out of the hands of Westminster and into the hands of this Parliament, the better. And the sooner Richard Leonard supports that, the better for families all over our country. Richard Leonard. The First Minister is defending her government's decision to freeze this fund over which they have got responsibility. And don't just listen to me, Oxfam, the Poverty Alliance, the Child Poverty Action Group, all recommend today increasing the fund. And whilst the government has reformed the formula, it does not address what this report today calls fundamental under-resourcing. In fact, it's so fundamentally under-resourced that local authorities do not even advertise the fund for fear of being unable to cope with demand. This is the fund which hands out crisis grants to families in emergency situations. So, First Minister, will you do everything that you can? Will you listen to this report? Will you provide additional lifeline support? Will you, at the very least, and finally, increase in real terms the Scottish Welfare Fund provision? First Minister. Well, we, we have protected the Scottish Welfare Fund in the face of cuts to our budget from the Conservatives. I, I stand to be corrected if I'm getting this wrong, uh, but I'm not even sure Labour and Wales have a national welfare fund. So perhaps they should look to their own uh, record where they are in government. But let me, let me make a genuine offer again to Richard Leonard. Every penny of the Scottish budget this year is accounted for. So if Richard Leonard wants us to give more money to the Scottish Welfare Fund this year, then if later today or tomorrow or even next week he wants to bring to me proposals uh, about where we take that money from within the already allocated Scottish yes. budget, I will listen to that and I am prepared to have that discussion. But we never hear that from Richard Leonard and that is the problem. So we will continue to protect the poorest. Uh, next week, of course, uh, there will be a statement setting out uh, our plans on the income supplement, which uh, I look forward uh, to setting out to this parliament. But I say again, Richard Leonard will have little or zero credibility on these issues for as long as he is prepared to defend the powers that determine all of these things, not lying in this parliament, but lie in the hands of a Conservative government at Westminster. Thank you. We've got a, a number of constituency supplementary or interest in asking constituency supplementaries. The first is from Claire Adamson to be followed by David Stewart. Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, you will be aware of the redundancies announced at Liberty Steel Dale Works in my Motherwell Mushaw constituency. 
Our thoughts are with the 18 workers affected and their families. Can the First Minister outline what support can be given to those facing redundancy? And does she also share my disappointment in the UK government who have failed to listen and failed to act to support the steel industry in the UK? First Minister. Uh, well, can I thank Claire Adamson for raising this issue, which is of huge importance in her constituency. It is, of course, concerning that Liberty Steel has made redundancies at the DL <coughs> plate mill uh, as Brexit uncertainty impacts on their orders. Uh, this, of course, will be an anxious time for employees, and the Scottish Government has offered support to those facing redundancy through our PACE initiative. As our actions show, and I think Claire Adamson is right to say they stand in stark contrast to the inaction of the Tory government eh, when it comes to the steel industry. This government is committed to a sustainable future for the steel sector and to helping the industry to compete in global markets. Going forward, the firm has said that it does have confidence in the underlying health of the plant and hopes to begin recruitment again when the market improves and the government will do everything it can to support them in that endeavour. David Stewart to be followed by Richard Lyle. David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The First Minister will be well aware of an alleged data breach by NHS Highland, which exposed confidential names and email addresses of 37 people living with HIV. Whilst I welcome the apology by the Board, does the First Minister share my view that confidentiality is a core principle of the NHS and the decision to disclose HIV status is a matter for individuals themselves and theirs alone. First Minister. Uh, I, I do agree very strongly uh, with that and would uh, agree strongly with the sentiments behind Dave Stewart's question. Uh, the safety of patient data is of the utmost importance um, and as required this incident has been reported to the Information Commissioner. That happened within 24 hours. NHS Highland has taken steps rightly to apologise to patients and to respond directly and speedily to any concerns raised. A formal internal review of the incident is being conducted to understand any failings and clearly there have been uh, failings and to consider any steps to make sure that this does not happen in the future. Richard Lyle to be followed by Liam Kerr. Thank you, President Officer. First Minister, it's recently been reported that an official has received a substantial redundancy payment of between four hundred and eight hundred thousand pounds to leave North Lancashire Council. Can I therefore ask the First Minister's view on this matter, since this Labour authority continually suggests that it does not receive enough funding from her government? And what can be done, if anything, to stop these excessive payments being paid to local authority officials to leave their post early? First Minister. Well, I understand that Audit Scotland have said they are aware of this payment and they will be looking at it as part of their annual audit work. Uh, I think this is only proper given the apparent scale of the settlement. And I think it is understandable that questions are being raised by Richard Lyle and by others. Uh, while the Scottish Government has no direct role in this matter, I'm very clear there is a duty on all bodies to ensure that public money is spent appropriately and to be able to justify the decisions they take. While Audit Scotland will be looking at the matter, I'm sure that the Accounts Commission will also be giving it consideration. Liam Kerr to be followed by James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, on Monday, employees at textiles company Don & Lowe in Forfar discovered that 55 jobs are to go. The employer says other countries are much more competitive to do business in. This has been a real shock to the community. So what is the Scottish Government's response to this and what will they do to support those affected? First Minister. Uh, well, can I thank the member for raising uh, this issue? Any job losses uh, are deeply regrettable, and that is the case in uh, the case of this company in Forfar as well. The Scottish Government, as we do in all situations like this, will first and foremost liaise with the company to see whether there is any action we can take to avert the need for redundancies. If that doesn't prove possible, our PACE initiative will work with affected employees to help them into alternative employment. I'm very happy to ask the Employment Secretary to write to the member to update on the actions we're taking in this particular case. James Kelly to be followed by Shona Robertson. James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I draw the First Minister's attention to the consultation being run by Glasgow Life? proposing the closure of six public golf courses in Glasgow, including the popular courses at Lynn Park and Little Hill. Given the success of the Commonwealth Games and the European Championships and the legacy of increased sporting participation, it is indeed astonishing that the SNP Glasgow City Council is proposing the closure of these popular sporting facilities. Does the First Minister agree with me that the proposals should be ditched and replaced with a strategy to increase participation at golf courses 
uh, and get more young and older people out onto the courses and enjoying this popular sport. First Minister. Well, firstly, can I, before I come on to the specific issue, can I say as a, a general uh, aside that the current administration of Glasgow City Council is uh, right now uh, having to raise, uh, and rightly, having to raise the revenue to pay the equal pay claims for female employees that the last Labour administration shamefully failed to do over so many years. And therefore, I think sometimes a little bit of self-reflection and humility on the part of Labour members before they raise issues like this would be very appropriate. On the issue, uh, it is vitally important that we have a range of sports facilities available in the city of Glasgow and across the country. It is for Glasgow Life to carry out a proper consultation and to listen genuinely to the views uh, of local people and then to make those decisions. And uh, I trust uh, the administration uh, of this city council to take uh, a range of decisions much better than their predecessors of the Labour Party. Shona Robertson, followed by Neil Bibby. Shona Robertson. The First Minister will be aware of the importance of Scotland's space industry, its potential for growth and our expertise in satellite technology. Does she therefore share my disappointment with the decision by the Natural Environment Research Council overseen by the UK Government to withdraw funding for Scotland's only satellite receiving centre at Dundee University? which has been praised for its work uh, done by NASA and others, now bringing the future of the centre into question. Is she aware that discussions between the university, uh, Clyde Space and others with a commercial interest in maintaining the station appear to have reached an impasse? Therefore, will she ask her minister to work with the parties involved in the hope of finding a way ahead which could safeguard the future of this centre, which has faithfully served the space community for over 50 years? First Minister. Well, can I thank Shona Robinson for raising this issue and agree uh, wholeheartedly with her about the huge potential of the space and satellite industry in Scotland. Indeed, we already uh, have a very visible presence in the space sector globally. More small satellites are manufactured in Glasgow than any other place in Europe, and almost a fifth of the UK space sector jobs rest here in Scotland. I share her concerns about the implications of the National Environment Research Council decision to cut funding to the station. I am also aware of the apparent impasse in discussions with commercial parties. Scottish Enterprise is engaged to find a way forward that preserves the assets of the Satellite Receiving Centre and retains the related expertise in Scotland. Uh, I am somewhat constrained in what I can say and what we can disclose in terms of the content of ongoing commercial discussions, but I will ask the relevant minister to look into the matter further and write to the member with an update as soon as possible. Thank you. Neil Bibby to be followed by Christine Graham. Since its uh, restoration 45 years ago, the historic paddle steamer, the Waverley, a symbol of Scotland, has sailed every summer on the Clyde coast and beyond until now. Expensive boiler repairs likened to open heart surgery have put the Waverley's future in doubt. That's why Jackie Bailey, myself and many others are supporting a £2.3 million boiler refit appeal. Given the need to preserve the last sea-going paddle steamer in the world, given the tourism that the Waverley brings to towns and villages across the West Coast, and given that next year is the Scottish Government's year of coasts and waters, can the First Minister assure us that government support is available to help with these repairs and save the Waverley? First Minister. Well, can I thank Neil Bibby for raising this issue? Uh, the Waverley, of course, is a tremendous asset and a great national treasure, and we should all uh, want to see it preserved and continue for many years to come. Uh, I know there is a fundraising campaign underway, and I certainly undertake today that the Scottish Government will be happy to speak uh, to those involved in that and to those involved uh, in efforts to uh, fix the Waverley to see uh, that we, to make sure that the government is doing everything we can to support their efforts. And the relevant minister would be very happy to uh, write to the member to update on progress in due course. Thank you. And Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Uh, First Minister, NHS Borders, uh, even with a 10.1 million bailout from the Scottish Government with another anticipated, is making cuts. The gynaecological ward is already closed and the switch ward covering 20 wards, pharmacy and so on, is on a so-called hit list. Calls possibly being processed from Edinburgh. And I can see the foresee the possibility of serious concerns for healthcare in the Borders General Hospital if this were to happen with the lack of local knowledge and so on. Now the Health Secretary is well aware of the issues arising from the Board's failures which led to those bailouts. Can I ask if there's more that can be done? 
First Minister. Uh, the Health Secretary will continue to work with the Board uh, to make sure that these issues are being addressed. Uh, this year, the Government is investing in excess of £207 million in NHS borders. Uh, the medium-term financial framework for health and social care sets out the approach that we are taking, uh, both to further increase investment and deliver sustainable services across the country. The Health Secretary, uh, as I said, will engage with borders to reiterate our expectation that within the three-year flexibility to open to them, they work towards a sustainable financial position, but also ensuring that there is no detrimental impact on the quality and safety of patient care. And I know the Health Secretary would be happy to discuss the matter further uh, with Christine Graham. Thank you. Question number three, Willie Rennie. In 2014, after months of refusal, Alex Salmond eventually agreed to introduce free nursery education for two-year-olds in poverty. Five years later, only one-third of those children are getting this foundation. Why is this First Minister failing these children? First Minister. Uh, well, I, I don't accept that. There is the availability uh, of childcare across Scotland for vulnerable two-year-olds, in addition, of course, to the provision uh, for three- and four-year-olds. And we continue to encourage parents who want to make use of that uh, to do so. Uh, and we, our job is to make sure that provision is there, of course, as well as doing that. We are currently working with uh, local authorities and investing significant sums of money in local authorities uh, to transform uh, childcare to double the provision that's currently available by the end of this parliament. So this is one of the uh, big success stories of this parliament and it's one that we should both be proud of and continue to work to build upon as this government is determined to do. That is, that is simply not good enough. This is supposed to be the government's most transformative infrastructure project. But there's a new report this morning by the charity Save the Children. They are not impressed. In page after page of evidence, they say that these children are missing out and that this could jeopardise closing the poverty-related attainment gap. In England, 70% of two-year-olds in poverty are receiving free nursery education. That's double the rate in Scotland. It's unbelievable. The Conservative government is able to reach more children in poverty than the SNP. It's been five years. Does the First Minister not think she should have made more progress by now? First Minister. Well, it's good to see Willie ready back to his usual role of defending a Conservative uh, government. <laughs> this government. This government is doing significantly more in expanding early years education and childcare uh, than the government south of the border and that will continue to be the case. Uh, we will look carefully at the Save the Children report and of course, and of course we will continue uh, to work with them and other organisations to make sure that the rollout of the expanded hours uh, goes effectively. There is a higher target for two-year-olds as part of the expansion, uh, but we will continue to work with local authorities to make sure that for two-year-olds, for three-year-olds and for four-year-olds, Scotland will be leading the way of any part of the UK when it comes to giving our children the very best start in life. With some further supplementaries, the first from Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, given that yesterday the SNP voted against exempting police officers, care assistants, volunteers, firefighters, shift workers and those on low incomes from having to pay a workplace parking levy, does the, does the First Minister still agree with her party colleagues who call this a progressive tax on the elite? First Minister. Well, we're giving uh, councils a discretionary power. That's the empowerment of local yeah. councils that the Tories used to demand yeah. of us. No council has to use that power. Yeah. Councils that do decide to use that power will require to do a full consultation. Yeah. Part of that consultation will be to look at the exemptions yeah. they apply in their local areas. But I am quite interested in the position of Jamie Green, who's uh, stood up here, as he has done many times in recent weeks, and opposed workplace parking levy. And the reason I'm interested in this is because a report from uh, the Rural Economy Committee, which, remember, is chaired by the Conservative Edward Mountain, earlier in this Parliament said this, and as far as I'm aware, it was a unanimous report. The committee is of the view 
that demand management measures uh, like workplace parking levies have potential to make a significant emissions reduction oh. contribution. Oh. It, calls, it calls on the Scottish Government to consider whether these measures should have greater prominence in the final climate change plan. <laughs> I mention this, presiding officer, because one Jamie Green is a member of that committee. Kezia, Kezia Dugdale to be followed by Gillian Martin. Kezia Dugdale. First Minister, despite the limited progress which has been made, this country still has a care system where over 60% of our children do not attain even one National 5 qualification. Where care experienced young people are around 10 times less likely to go on to higher education and where in every age group and at every level they are behind their peers in literacy and in numeracy. These statistics embarrass me. They should embarrass Scotland. If they embarrass the First Minister, what is she going to do about it? First Minister. Well, as I'm grateful to Kezia Dugdale for raising this issue. It's an issue very close to my heart. I have made very clear that I consider not just a political commitment, but a personal commitment to improve the outcomes of young people who grow up in care. I attended uh, the Who Cares Scotland event on Friday of last week uh, to talk to them about the actions that they think we should be taking now uh, while the independent care review is underway and I gave a commitment to them that we would uh, do exactly that. We've already taken action for example the care experienced bursary and we will continue to do exactly that. Uh, the outcomes are not good enough not just here in terms of school qualifications but uh, university access and a whole range of other indicators. Uh, so there is work to do and it's an issue I and the government take incredibly seriously. But I would say to Kezia Dugdale, and I know she will uh, recognise this, that while there is a gap, as she has described there, the recent statistics show that gap is now closing. And the responsibility for us is to make sure that we continue to do the work to close that gap even further and ultimately, as soon as we can, to completely eradicate that gap. And that is what we are very focused on achieving. Thank you. Gillian Martin to be followed by Murdo Fraser. Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister will share the heartbreak of many in this chamber who watched last night's Scotland match. But my goodness, our women's team have done us proud at our first World Cup in 21 years. Will the First Minister join me in congratulating them for this fantastic achievement? And will she also set out how we can build on this success, raise the profile of the women's game in Scotland and get more girls into sport? First Minister. Uh, well, everyone who watched the match last night will have experienced the roller coaster emotions and the heartbreak of the final result. But in recent weeks, we've also watched a young, talented national team take us to our first World Cup in 21 years, entertain us with some brilliant football, uh, score five great goals. And most importantly of all, we've seen them inspire the country and inspire the next generation of wee girls and wee boys who dream of pulling on the Scotland shirt. Uh, we'll do everything we can to support further development of the women's game. Um, I spoke to Shelley Kerr just a wee while ago um, and said to her what I'll say publicly to the Chamber and, and to the team directly now, and I'm sure I say it on behalf of all of us. They are feeling very, very sore this morning. Uh, but to all of them, you should be very, very proud of your achievements. You have done Scotland proud and you will be back stronger than ever in the future. And Murder Fraser. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, yesterday, the banking group CYBG announced it would be dropping the Clydesdale Bank brand after 175 years. Does the First Minister share my concern about the loss of this historic and iconic Scottish brand? And while CYBG are saying they intend to continue issuing Clydesdale Bank notes despite the rebrand, is she as worried as I am that this important part of Scottish banking heritage could well be under threat in the longer term. Yeah. First Minister. Uh, well, this obviously is not a decision for the Scottish Government. It is a decision for CYBG. Um, I think all of us want to see important Scottish brands preserved, and uh, I hope that the Clydesdale Bank will give thought to that as they make the changes that they've announced. Uh, in terms of uh, the Clydesdale Bank uh, banknotes, the branding 
uh, there uh, can continue for the future uh, as well. So we will continue, as we do with all banks, all companies, to discuss these issues with them, raise any concerns uh, we've got and support them uh, as much as we can as they take the decisions they consider to be right for their own uh, business interests. Thank you. Question number four, Ruth McGuire. Presiding officer, to ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government is marking Refugee Week. First Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government is delighted to support Refugee Festival Scotland, which begins today on World Refugee Day. The Community Secretary will be visiting an exhibition in Glasgow uh, designed and produced by refugees and hearing from those involved in the festival. Uh, the festival is coordinated by the Scottish Refugee Council and provides an opportunity for refugees to tell their stories and for us to recognise their courage, strength and resilience. And it gives us the opportunity to recognise the contribution refugees and asylum seekers from all over the world make to life here in Scotland. Of course, we've also got to remember that refugees have sought sanctuary from war, terrorism and torture. And I'm proud that they are welcomed here and can begin to rebuild their lives. So I would like to thank all those involved in supporting refugees across our country. And Ruth McGuire. I thank the First Minister for that answer. People in Scotland should feel proud that we've lived up to our global responsibility to find homes for thousands of refugees. However, because of the callous Tory government, we still have lock change evictions by circle, children and pregnant women behind barbed wire at Dungavel and a hostile environment which persecutes instead of protects vulnerable people. In a few weeks, we'll have a new Prime Minister. What should their priority be when it comes to fixing this broken system? First Minister. Well, of course, the policies and the implications of those policies that Ruth McGuire has just narrated to the Chamber should shame uh, the Conservative Government at Westminster. And I hope that a new Prime Minister will think again think again fundamentally and very, very quickly. Uh, I would certainly call on the incoming Prime Minister to immediately overhaul the current failed asylum system. We urgently need a new process that is based uh, on some very important and basic principles, fairness, dignity, respect for human rights, and one that doesn't people, uh, leave people at risk of destitution or homelessness with other public services then having to pick up the pieces. Uh, we need to see a 28-day time limit on immigration detention and a ban, a ban on detention of children and pregnant women. Uh, an action that could be taken uh, today uh, by the current Prime Minister and the current Home Secretary is to ensure that local authorities who voluntarily accept asylum dispersal are provided with adequate funding to support people to rebuild their lives and communities from the very first day of their arrival. Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The, the First Minister is right about those policy levers being at Westminster, but the responsibility to support people who are currently being failed in our communities lies with us as well. Hundreds of asylum seekers in Glasgow, while we celebrate the Refugee Festival, will be facing the threat of mass evictions and destitution. Does the First Minister agree that what they need now, in the coming weeks, is not just a restatement of the existing government commitment to provide with the City Council emergency accommodation. They need that emergency accommodation to be available and they need it now. When will it be and what can the First Minister tell us about the work that's ongoing? First Minister. Well, the Scottish Government will continue to work with Glasgow City Council or any other uh, council in this situation to make sure that the support asylum seekers need is there. And that is an ongoing uh, obligation and responsibility. And that includes, of course, access to accommodation. Uh, but the point I made uh, a moment ago, and I know this is one that Patrick Harvey will agree with, uh, but it is one that is essential uh, and it is essential that it is understood by the UK government. Uh, where local authorities voluntarily accept asylum dispersal, which we encourage local authorities to do, they must get from the UK government the adequate funding they need to support those people. So let us absolutely live up to our responsibilities, but let us also continue to press the UK government to live up to their responsibilities as well. Question number five, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that cases of Lyme disease are diagnosed and treated as early as possible. First Minister. Uh, we are committed to raising awareness of Lyme disease and supporting those affected with what is a complex infection. We have a multidisciplinary export expert group dedicated to Lyme disease, which is part of the Scottish Health Protection Network. The Chief Medical Officer wrote last week to all NHS uh, Scotland health boards and GP practices to highlight the important role they play 
hopefully not only in the early diagnosis and management of Lyme disease cases, but also in promoting awareness of ticks and tick-borne infections amongst their patients. Brian Riddle. Can I thank the First Minister for that answer? Uh, in Petitions Committee, we have heard evidence from those with lived experience and, and the chronic debilitating effects of the disease who say that their illnesses are not even being acknowledged. So, First Minister, what can the Scottish Government do for those patients who are bitten by a tick, infected with Lyme disease and multiple unidentified co-infections, miss their early treatment window because of that lack of recognition and develop the chronic disease? First Minister. Uh, well, my uh, initial answer set out what the Scottish Government is doing. Uh, early awareness uh, or awareness in order to aid prevention is vital here. That's why one of the uh, focuses of the multidisciplinary uh, group uh, will be to look at that. Uh, also making sure that clinicians, frontline clinicians, clinicians have the information they need uh, to diagnose and detect and therefore treat uh, the illness. Um, and of course, uh, the letter that the Chief Medical Officer wrote last week was designed to raise that awareness and make sure that those working, particularly GPs across our health service, have the information and the awareness they need uh, to ensure, firstly, prevention, but also early diagnosis and access to treatment of those affected. Thank you. Question number six, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the First Minister whether she will provide an update on the Scottish Government's plans to sell Presswick Airport. First Minister. Well, since the Scottish Government purchased Presswick Airport, we've been very clear that our intention is to return the business to the private sector when the time is right. The team at Presswick has continued to engage with potential buyers and investors to discuss proposals for developing the business under new ownership. Good progress continues to be made by the airport to increase revenue, deliver operating efficiencies and pursue opportunities for the future. In light of that progress, the airport has now placed an advert in the official journal of the European Union inviting expressions of interest. Any proposal submitted, of course, would uh, be considered carefully before any decision was taken to divest our shareholding or any part of it. And in the weeks ahead, it is very important that we protect the integrity of that process. Colin Smith. Can I thank the First Minister for that answer? Well, given that there are over 300 direct jobs at Presswick Airport and thousands more indirect jobs, all crucial to the Ayrshire economy, can the First Minister assure those workers that there will be no sale to any company that does not guarantee to secure and grow those jobs and ensure that there will be full consultation with the trade unions before any sale goes ahead? And will she also give an assurance to the taxpayer that any sale will be subject to agreement that the £40 million plus that has been loaned to Presswick Airport will be paid back in full by any new owner should one be found. First Minister. Well, I hope uh, the member will appreciate that I'm not going to go into too much speculative detail about any bids that might uh, come in and what consideration will be given to them. It's important that we protect the integrity of this uh, process and any decisions that would be taken, of course, have to be in the overall interests of Presswick Airport and those who work in it. I would certainly say I would fully expect engagement with trade unions and given uh, that the purpose for the Scottish Government uh, bringing Presswick Airport into public ownership was to protect jobs, then clearly uh, that is going to be a key consideration for the team at Presswick in the future as well. Uh, the eligibility questionnaire, which was published in the official journal, uh, also sets out some prime objectives for bidders and maintaining Presswick is, as an operational airport is one of those prime objectives. So the interest uh, of the local economy, the interest of the workers at the airport and of course the interest of the taxpayer will all be factors that have to be taken into account before any uh, future decisions are taken. Thank you very much and that concludes First Minister's questions. We're going to move on shortly to members business in the name of Polly McNeill on the first anniversary of the Glasgow School of Art fire. But before they do that, we're just under a short suspension to allow members, the ministers, to change seats and new members to come into the gallery. So a short suspension. <laughs>